We'll start this afternoon with clustering. <clears throat> Anybody care to define what a cluster is? <laughs> um, yes, it's a group. Any group? some objective function to partition the data in a special way that would then allow us to call some of the partitions, or all of the partitions that we have, um, clusters. There's a bit of a problem with partitioning data in the first place. That is, is it a fair assumption that all groups within the data, or all data points within the data, actually make sense in terms <coughs> of the cluster to which we would hope to uh, ascribe some kind of biological significance. That's, that's an assumption that's probably not always true. That's probably not, <coughs> generally not true. But it's, go about, it, it's what we go about. Now, partition the data according to some objective function in order to arrive at clusters. Basically, it's just saying a cluster is some group of data that is grouped according to an objective function. What would that objective function the word similarity. Could, could, could one imagine an objective function to build a cluster? And that's again rephrasing just the question, what is a cluster anyway? Why do we call something a cluster rather than just random arrangement of data points that I was just so inclined to pick out of my data set? Can we look at Can we look at the Euclidean distance? Um, sure, we can look at Euclidean distance. We can look at many different distances. But why would we do so? What would that help us? So I take two data <coughs> points, and <coughs> they're data points in a high dimensional data set, so I, I can interpret all the values that I've annotated it, all the features as. Um, a dimension in some high dimensional space, more generally speaking, that data point is a vector. And I take a second data point, also a vector on the same dimensions, but separated by some range of values in each of the dimensions. And then I simply calculate the Euclidean distance. Now what does that tell me in, uh, with reference to the idea of a cluster? What should a cluster be? Is it a measure of similarity? Because people provide two measurements that are really similar. <coughs> similar properties across a lot of different measurements. Right, so Euclidean distance, essentially similar to, uh, to uh, correlation, is a measure of distance. It's larger um, if the points are dissimilar, and it's smaller if they're very similar. Actually, it's not just a measure, it's a metric. We'll, we'll briefly define what that means in, in a moment. But once again, it, that doesn't help us define what a cluster is. It just tells us how do we measure similarities between points. Cluster is a number of vectors that are more similar to each other than to the rest of the vectors. And by that, I'm defining two measures of similarity. One, um, the so, the, the, uh, the so called uh, between. Okay, 
So I like that. That's usually how we think about clusters, not precisely in the words that, that you used, but the ideas of between and within always play a role. So if we define clusters, we want the clusters to be partitions that have the property that the distances of elements within a partition are smaller <coughs> than the distances <coughs> between the partitions. Not necessarily between the elements of the individual partitions, but between some property which we derive from the clusters. So in fact, if we have clusters that are located adjacent to each other, the distances between adjacent elements can in fact be smaller than the distances to some of the elements within a cluster. But still from the overall structure of things, we would say that this one element, though it's close to that one, would belong to this cluster and the other one to that cluster. So the distances within an entire cluster can be relatively large, even though the distances between clusters, individual distances, can be rather small. And that's kind of, you know, there's different, different ways to go about it. It goes beyond just looking at individual pairs of distances in, in many instances. It's kind of difficult to define that, though, because it critically depends on how we partition in the first place, how many, how many clusters we build, the kind of the, the degree of resolution or granularity that we apply to our data set, the separation that's inherent in the points, the exact algorithms that we use, and so on and so on. So there's many different ways. And if we look at data visually and then we define clusters in that data by saying, well, these are points that are close together and, and the others kind of don't belong there. It's exceedingly hard to cast that into a proper mathematical algorithm, not in the least because the, the function that well separates clusters might not be the same globally, but it might depend on the local environment of the data set. So there might need to be some kind of an adaption that is um, dependent on the actual features, which makes things very messy. And uh, not surprisingly, um, clustering is not a solved problem. There are many different clustering approaches, um, most of which apply very, very well, uh, work very, very well in specialized cases and um, fail miserably in others. But there's a number of principles and, and very simple algorithms that we can apply at the outset and, you know, again, start exploring our data, trying to start trying to find subsets that have something to do with each other, then exploring these subsets, looking at the individual properties of these subsets and figuring out whether that makes biological sense. Remember, exploratory data analysis is about hypothesis generation. What we talk about in clustering is to try to understand uh, clustering principles, uh, work a little bit with some basic hierarchical and partitioning methods, and talk about how to interpret clustering results in the first place, and run a little bit of um, cluster quality control and discuss alternatives. <coughs> It's actually interesting. Um, clusters are abundant in biological entities. And that's not trivial. You know, if you could think about proteins or if you could think about genes or systems or like that, there's no, nothing that says a protein has to be similar to another protein. They could all be equally dissimilar to each other. Or a biological pathway is similar in some properties to another biological pathway. Again, that's not necessary. You could define all of biology so that every element that you would look at is entirely unique and entirely different from anything else. But that's not how biology works. There's a lot of similarity in biology. There's a lot of reuse of modules and of ideas. Much of the similarity is due to homology, basically that um, inheritance and um, evolutionary divergence creates proteins, systems, pathways that are in some way um, similar because they're derived from something else and we can discover that. Other, 
other um, reasons for finding similarity or def defining clusters is because of convergent evolution. There's only a limited number of ways in which you can um, hydrolyze um, a peptide bond. So by convergent evolution, um, nature has come up with methods that at the catalytic core look exactly the same, i.e. the catalytic triad. So if you would be catal clustering these, these um, um, active sites of peptide hydrolases, you would find that some cluster in terms of the spatial arrangement of their active components because of convergent reasons because the number of possibilities that you can use amino acid side chains to, to hydrolyze peptide bonds is limited. And if we explore the space of possibilities with evolution over a large number of times, you will come up with the same solution in principle more than once. And there's a third reason for why things might be clustered or, or things might um, appear to be similar. So one was homology i.e. divergent evolution. Two is convergent evolution. The third important reason is random chance. If we look at a large number of elements, there are bound to be some that are similar to each other for no good reason whatsoever. And one of the challenges of cluster analysis is, of course, saying, well, once we've built these clusters, do they mean anything? Can we interpret them in the context of biology? It always goes back to biology. We're always in the state of not knowing and yet knowing a lot about something else, and we're trying to reconcile that. <coughs> Technically, clustering is an example of unsupervised learning, i.e., we throw clustering algorithms at a data set. We don't know anything about categories. We don't know uh, whether the clustering is right or wrong. Supervised learning means we have a training set where we know the results and then we can use the features of the known results to try to infer um, unknown results. But clustering is, is completely unsupervised. It's useful for the analysis of patterns in data. In the optimal case, it can lead to class discovering. And it is, as Lauren mentioned, a partitioning method. It partitions data into groups of elements that are more similar to each other than to elements in other groups. Um, it's a completely general method. It can be applied to genes, it can be applied to samples, to both at the same time, or whatever you want to do. As long as you have measurements, you can start clustering. The, one of the most basic and, and, and actually indeed one of the interesting methods is hierarchical clustering. Uh, we'll, we'll work with that a bit. Um, I think this we'll, we'll talk more about this, this principle of how it works as we actually compute it and have some, some visuals to work with. So <coughs> in hierarchical uh, clustering, you work with a number of items and a distance metric. So first you start by calculating the distances between, um, between all of the uh, individual elements. And then you p find the closest pairs of elements and merge them and define some average measure that now um, describes the two elements instead of the, the two elements jointly instead of individually. And then you do that again. You recompute the distances from that joint element to all the rest. And you again look for the closest, which might be to that merged element, might be to original elements. And you join them and so on until everything is joined into a, into, a single, uh, into a single root. And it looks very much like a phylogenetic tree. And so you compute that until all clusters have been merged into a single cluster. But what does a distance metric actually mean? What's a metric in the first place? In, a, in the mathematical sense, a metric has a very um, defined meaning. It has to fulfill exactly three conditions. The first two are kind of trivial. The first one is the identity condition, and that says if the distance between x and y is 0, then x is the same thing as y. Now, we might have two gene expression profiles that are identical numerical, 
they might be different gene expression profiles and the distance between them still might be zero. So in the mathematical sense that would be a violation. However, it just says that according to these identity, to these expression profiles, the two genes are not distinguishable. It doesn't make sense to say one is one and the other is the other. We, from just looking at the profiles, we would never be able to t tell a difference. The other feature of a metric is it has to be symmetric. So the distance between a point x and y has to be exactly the same as the distance between a point um, y and x. So if you invert it, it has to be it has to be the same. And the third thing is the triangle inequality. And that can be nasty, depending on the kind of metrics that you use. What the triangle inequality says is the distance between x and y is always smaller than, or at best equal to, the distance between x and some point z, and the distance between z and that point y that we're interested in. Essentially, if we paraphrase that, it says, in our metrics, there are no shortcuts. If we take something else than the direct route, it can never be shorter than the direct route. <coughs> now, depending on the metric that you use, that can't always be guaranteed. If we use Euclidean distance metrics or something, then um, it's, it's pretty clear and, and, and mathematically proven. But if you use some esoteric function which spits out a number, um, say, according to pathway membership or whatever, there's no guarantee that that's actually a metric un unless you look at it closely. And, and what happens? if you use a measure on clustering that is not a metric? Well, things get clustered all the same, but it means that cluster membership is no longer interpretable in a way. Because what cluster membership really says is once we have given um, a distance between two elements, we can, or a membership and a cluster, we, we can make basically a, a triangulation inference to a third element. It has to be outside or it has to be somewhere else. Um, if the metric breaks down, that third element could be anywhere. It could be much closer than, than the first two and, 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 and somewhere, somewhere different. So even though we would be generating something that looks like a clustering, an interpretation in terms of similarity would no longer be possible. So if you ever go out and define your own metrics, um, which would be interesting because it, it's certainly interesting to use more biological and more interesting functions to calculate metrics than simply using Euclidean distance all the time. So if you ever do that, you still have to be careful for the purpose of clustering that we have a true metric to work with. There's a number of different ones. We've measured Euclidean. Uh, there's a metric which is the so-called Manhattan dis distance, which basically says instead of taking the diagonal route, we we take um, root only on, uh, on an orthogonal uh, grid. Um, a very interesting metric is 1 minus correlation. So we can calculate a correlation coefficient between two sets and then uh, subtract 1 from the correlation uh, coefficient. So remember the, the range of the correlation uh, coefficient can be between minus 1 and 1. A distance always has to be positive. And if we say, one minus correlation, we map the correlation coefficient into the interval from 0 to 2, and then we can use that as a distance metric. And there's something that's called a, a Hamming distance, um, which we need for ordinal, binary, or categorical data, i.e. not the kind of um, real value data that we normally use. And <coughs> that's just the sum over all identical elements. So a Hamming distance um, of, say, five elements or a, a, of five dimensions um, is five if all five dimensions are equal or is three if three of the five dimensions are equal and so on. Um, Hamming distance or the related edit distance um, is you've, you've come across similar measures uh, that, that would correspond to uh, 
the measure of identity of aligned sequences. Right? So if, if, the, if two aligned uh, sequence characters are the same, they would score one point um, for the Hamming distance and you would sum over all the points th that are identical. So does it matter? Unfortunately, yes. So here's a comparison of um, a gene data, uh, expression data set where we look at a heat map of, of metrics. So each of these points is, is colored and sorted according to the similarity of these data points overall in their expression vectors. One is Euclidean, one is Manhattan, one is uh, one minus correlation. Red values mean that the points are uh, very similar. Yellow and white values mean they are not very similar. And um, <coughs> so what does this mean? How do we interpret this? What, what do we find here? Well, it's apparent that under this arrangement where we group together similar elements in such a heat map, we can get a block structure. The block structure basically says the group of elements that's plotted along the axis here is similar to the group of elements that's plotted along the axis here. The group of elements that's in the middle here is similar to itself in its, in its own group. There's a subgroup in here that we can define. There's another subgroup in here, and so on. So if we find block structures in these heat maps, it means there are similarities that our distance metric is able to figure out. So if we take um, a, a distance metric and we call it, we we get a heat map and the heat map just looks random, it means that distance metric is not suitable to attempt clustering in, in, the, in that data set. We will, if we force the algorithm to do so, we will find clusters, but we're probably not going to be happy with the results because we're going to find that even though we can separate them into clusters and partition them, um, the results are not going to be very different. We'll get clusters that where the internal structures, i.e., for example, the expression profiles, look exactly the same between one cluster and the other cluster. So in this case, um, if I would look at the metrics here, I would definitely go with one minus correlation. <coughs> now, unfortunately, that's not the only parameter that we, can, that we can change. So we could simply try different distance metrics, but there's more. Um, we also need a linkage method. And linkage methods um, describe how we compare how we compare clusters with each other once we form them. So I told you that initially we start from all elements and then we combine elements to clusters and then we calculate <coughs> distances between clusters and elements or clusters and clusters. And there's a different way there are different ways to do this. So there's an average linkage um, where we take the distance of every element <coughs> in one cluster and compute the distance to every element in another cluster and then average over these distances. Um, there's single linkage, which simply asks for the distance between the closest elements in the clusters. Complete distance asks for the longest distance between the elements in the clusters. And we can also look at distance between centroids, where we take some kind of a weighted average um, of, of elements and then compute the distances between these weighted averages, between these means. So there are different ways to do this. Um, some of the ways are going to be better under some circumstances and for some data sets than others. And it's not trivial to decide. You basically have to look at the results and um, you can either apply, uh, apply some mathematical methods that, that show whether the information within these clusters is very good, or um, you ideally might have some idea about the underlying biology, and then you could say, then you could ask, well, which of these methods, for example, leads to clusters that have the highest, uh, the most homogeneous uh, go terms associated with them, or something similar. So orthogonal information. Um, right. So I th I think with these preliminaries, 
we should we should try to cluster some data and we'll cluster some expression data so I hope you've you've uh, loaded this file if if not it's loaded in the usual way from REDA clustering dot R from GitHub or I think explicitly this would be GitHub dot com begin as as the project file. Anybody have trouble finding that? Holler if you do. So what's in the box here? Um, oh, we'll just get, we'll just go through that. Okay, <clears throat> the data I'd like to work with here is again cell cycle data but a different experiment, and this time it's not pre-arranged data, but it's um, the entire um, data set of a cell cycle experiment um, that is deposited on GEO, the Gene Expression Omnibus, the NCBI uh, database that stores and makes publicly available um, gene, expression, um, gene expression data. So GEO has um, a nice tool which is called Geo2R. And with Geo2R, and, and it's really easy to use, there's a YouTube tutorial on, on how to use it. Um, I always uh, teach that in, in my um, introductory undergraduate bioinformatics course and nobody really has problems with that, so it must be very, very easy. Um, you basically can load the data set, you can define groups within the data set, and then you can run an analysis for differentially expressed genes. The link, the name, here. That should be the correct one, I hope. Can anybody confirm that that works? Yeah. Right, so you can, you can load the data sets, in your browser, you can, you can define groups and you can use bioconductor packages on that and the, the, the code runs on the NCBI servers. Uh, use bioconductor packages to identify differentially expressed genes. And the neat thing about that is once you're done, you can also download the exact R code that was used in identifying your, your differentially expressed genes and rerun the whole thing at home and modify it and do more with the data. And that's actually a very nice thing. So, so basically, this site has, has a code generator that um, creates code based on how you worked with the site in principle. As far as I know, there's not a version that supports RNA-seq data. So Geo2R, as far as I know, only runs on, on, um, on microarray data. If, if anybody ever will prove me wrong, it means the NCBI has added functionality and I would be more than pleased because it's really a neat tool to have. So that's the caveat here at the moment. I believe it only works for microarray data. So how does it work? Well, first we... <coughs> Basically, this first part of the code all the way to here is essentially taking verbatim from GU2R, adding some comments and, and rearranging some things a little bit, but it's the same functionality. So at first, we, we source a program from the web. So the, the R source command that we normally use to, to run script files Um, that, that source function that we use to run script files um, can also be run 
from web pages where this is available. So the Bi Bioconductor project has a web page available, bioclight.r, which is their own version of an installer for bioconductor packages. So once you have installed this, you can run Bioconductor Light and <coughs> um, download and install packages. Now when you do that, sometimes you will be asked in case you already have old packages that are required as dependencies on your machine, you will be asked whether you would like to update all, some, or none of the packages. Uh, to that, you should always answer all. If you don't update all of your dependent packages, there's a, there's a frustrating chance that something subtly will not work as intended in the package that you're using. So in this case, I update all. And then um, it asks me, do I want to install from sources the packages which need compilation? So some of the packages in their newest versions have not been compiled as binaries that work on Windows or <coughs> um, Mac computers or Linux computers. But they can be compiled <coughs> there um, by using the respective um, Fortran or C compilers for, for things that, that are beneath that. It doesn't mean that it won't work. It kind of means there's a bleeding edge version which is more recent than the last compiled one that we have. So I usually just answer no. I don't want to compile from, uh, install from source. Simply give me the packages as they are to the best that we have them. I, that usually works very well. If you if you have bugs that look like they're real bugs that have something to do with the system, you might try installing packages from sources, but compiling packages from sources over a large number of packages takes a long, long amount of time. It's, it, it usually works well, but um, just by default, update all of the packages, but don't install from source um, for those that, that require the source. Okay, so now it has downloaded uh, a Biobase and and um, the dependent that its dependencies. Geo query. <coughs> and um, and Lima, I've already installed that. And then you load the, the typical libraries. And the next thing that uh, one needs to do is to download the G set, GSE 26922 from uh, GEO from the NCBI. Now, that doesn't always go without a hitch. I'm not entirely sure why. It might be that they recognize that we have 127 queries for the same thing originating from the same IP address and then they start shutting it down. So I've seen in courses that um, uh, get geo doesn't you doesn't always work as as uh, as needed. So it's a bit patchy, but for the purpose of the workshop, it's probably better to load this data set from the backup that's in your files, and that's simply executing load gse two six nine two two dot r data, which is a large expression set of 101.9 megabytes size which was compressed to 16 megabytes. So this is, this is the real thing. It's a, it's a really large uh, microarray data set. For your work at home um, or for working with different expression sets or different geo IDs, you would simply use the G set um, whatever here um, and set the matrix to true. Okay, so let's see what we have. Um, it's an expression set. It is assay data. It has one features over 18 samples. 
um, the samples have different sample names, there's metadata there, and so on. Um, if we look into the structure of the G set, there's a lot of stuff going on. So this is bioconductor for you. It's extremely powerful, um, but I would, I would say uh, it has a learning curve. Um, it uses an object-oriented system, an S4 class system under the hood, which, which, is, which works a bit different than the data structures that we've worked with so far. Um, but it's very powerful and it, it, it really supports large-scale bioinformatics very well. Now, what I'd like you to do is you should be able to figure out, simply given this identifier, GSE 26922, what the, <coughs> the 18 samples in this data set signify. What are they? So somebody gives you an expression data set, and now you're tasked to, s to find information about it. Again, this is the question about the underlying biology. These are not just numbers. They're the results of a biological experiment. In order to interpret them and use them correctly, we need a little bit of an idea about what that experiment did and what these data, what these data columns mean. So where would you find that? A geo, perhaps. That's a good guess. One could Google for it. Maybe that's also a valid approach. I would suspect that if Google works correctly on, on, on that identifier, it would lead you to geo. So let's figure it out. What, what can you learn? What can you find about? GSE Can anybody paraphrase the experiment that, that we're looking at here? Exactly. So HeLa cells are synchronized with a cell cycle block. The block is released, then they start doing their thing, and that means dividing. Um, <coughs> and um, at various time points, we're taking samples. In order to learn more about what these samples and the time points are, we find that information under the samples description. So the first three points here are blocked HeLa cells, biological replicate one, two, and three. So this experiment has biological replicates. And they're the first three uh, data sets. 
And then we have biological replicates, one, two, three, four, two hours after release, four hours after release, six, eight, and 12 hours after release. And each of these experiments, i.e. the biological replicates, has its own identifier for the um, actual microarray that was used. And all of them are grouped together in this geo expression set. So that's how such an expression set is structured. Good, so that's important information to have when we analyze our data. So these 18 data points that we have here are six sets of three biological replicates each of cell cycle expression. <coughs> now, um, There's a, a couple of um, bioconductor commands here that, that get everything running. We make labels that we can use later on. We define group names for all samples here. And that is the first three samples get a group name of G0. The second three samples get a group name of G1, G2, G3, G4, and G5. Um, we log transform them. We take the groups and treat them as factors. Add that to the gene set description um, and define a design for the differential expression experiment, i.e. a model matrix based on this gene set description. Um, basically, this says compare everything against everything and tell me which of the compared groups now have statistically significant, um, statistically uh, significant differential expression. And then we want to return genes with the highest differential expression. So once again, this experiment, too, treats the data points as independent. We're not actually doing a time series or, or true cyclical analysis. Now, um, <clears throat> after that's all been defined, um, we do a, a fit. Um, from the model matrix against the actual data um, and then calculate contrasts, i.e. Um, uh, G5 minus G0, G1 minus G0, and so on, to, to actually find the differentially expressed genes. And after that, the significance is evaluated at the 0 0.01 uh, level of significance and after that, the whole thing is adjusted by false discovery rate, which takes into account multiple testing. We'll talk a little more about multiple testing uh, later, but this is false discovery rate. And we come up with a table, uh, the top table, TT here, of the 250 most significantly differentially expressed genes in that data set. So mind you, these are differentially expressed genes. These are not necessarily uh, regulated genes. They just show some expression difference um, between, between the groups here. And then GEO loads some additional uh, platform annotation. Um, platform annotation essentially says which spot corresponds to which gene, and what are these genes, and what are their properties. And in the end, um, we have this, uh, this uh, top table. So head TT. <clears throat> so these are the, uh, f the six most highly expressed genes, um, a histone, CDC8, a CCNE2, another histone, and so on, with 
um, adjusted p-values on the order of um, 8 to the 10 to the minus 12th. What does that even mean, a p-value in this context? Most significantly differentially expressed genes. What, what does a p-value here mean? What probability are we, are we measuring here? Any idea? You have differentially expressed genes and you annotate them with a p-value. Mm -hmm. So that are, that's basically the probability that there is no differential expression the probability that um, the expression values are all constant. A low p-value says the, the probability that there is no differential expression is very small. And we estimate that probability um, from how variable the data are internally within the groups that we set and how different they are from, from other groups. The lower the variance within these uh, replicates and the higher the difference between um, the individual measurements, the smaller the p-value that there's nothing going on here. Um, right. So let's, let's look at the top gene and, and plot it look at the original expression values. What did we find here? Remember these are triplicates of three, so there's a small variation in this triplicate. There's a high value here, lower value here. This goes down, this also goes down, this goes up. So there's a significant difference between these replicates, but within the, each of the replicates, um, the, the measurements are very stable, very reproducible. And that uh, gives the question of whether it is differentially expressed a very low p-value. Um, the, hmm? the vertical axes are exp uh, log expression levels, so log ratios. Um, so these would be the the data values for the, for the top three. So let's uh, process this for cluster analysis. To use essentially the same approaches for cluster analysis, it's useful to take this table with all the information that it contains and make a table that contains only numbers and just a single value for the biological replicates. So we'll take all the uh, biological replicates and we'll cluster them. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll average them and assign that to a table that we will use and call uh, DAT. We'll have a table for gene symbols that we can use to annotate that. So we go through our top table here, through the 250 genes, and we take the expression values of um, Um, columns 1 to 3 for t equals 0, the expression values of columns 4 to 6, 7 to 9, and so on. And we'll place that, we'll take the averages and we'll put that into a column. <coughs> and just put all of that together. Done. 
Okay. Now we would, a, a good way to work with this is um, to use IDs as row names so that we can simply specify, we can pull out individual elements simply by the, by the gene name. But before we do that, we have to figure out whether there are any duplicated values here. And yes, indeed, there are duplicated values. One kind of duplication is where um, it's just an empty string. And another kind of duplication is where some genes are repeated. Now, we also notice that there are these, these slashes here. These represent spots that um, measure the expression values of more than one gene at a time. So we can simply remove that and then set these, these row names. And we can also remove all rows that have spots for isoforms, i.e., with these slash characters. And that completes the creation of an expression data set that we can use for clustering. So if, if something is in a significant intermediate result like that, you can use the write.csv function to write it and store it, and uh, if you need it again, then you can read it back um, in, in the following way. Or you can just save, so basically this, this saves the data set as a comma-separated value, which might be important if you want to go back and edit things and, and change things around. But you can also simply save the, the binary object in the way that we've used before with the save load functions or save RDS and read RDS, which is essentially the same thing. So we have this data. Let's do a heat map. Default parameters, one heat map coming up. Yay, what does it mean? It's a heat map. So what are the colors? Presumably, some of the colors mean high expression and some of the colors mean low expression. And I don't know which one is which. So how do we find out? We could add a legend. So the legend would need to, to take the range of values that's available and, and uh, print that out. So one way to find that out is, is just to look at a small number of, of uh, genes, a smaller number, where we can actually identify the name, maybe. Um, right. So in this case here, um, FNIP1 is a gene name that appears at the top here and has very clearly uh, some value at T0 and at T2 that is either high or low, and very clearly a value at T6 and T8 that is also similar and either high or low. So let's just pull that out and have a look. So um, <coughs> We want data where the row is FNIP1, and we want all the columns. OK, so here we go. T0 and T2 have values in the 10s. T4 and T6 have values in the 11s. T8 is 11, and T12 is 10.9. OK, so log expression differences. Is yellow high or low? Is red high or low? Low. 
Does everybody know who doesn't know yet? Nobody will admit it. Who knows? Nobody will admit that either. OK. So uh, you see T0, red, has a relatively low log expression value. Um, T4, <coughs> orange, and T6, yellow, has a higher relative expression value. So in this depiction here, red means low expression, l low log expression values, and um, yellow means high log expression values. So red is low, yellow is high. Does white mean that the data is missing? No, white means it's even higher. So these are the highest values here. Is it difficult to have a legend shown in R? Um, it's not, probably not difficult. I'd, I'd need to explore to add a legend here. Let me see. Maybe it's just a question of saying legend equals true, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's that easy. Yeah, no, it, basically the, the legend would need to, to refer to the colors. I don't even see the colors here. Is column side colors and new side colors, is that? No, that's something else. I think it's in the dot arguments. Anyway, so it's, it's not a trivial um, just change one parameter. <clears throat> so what I've done here is, um, just for illustration from readability, I've just plotted every fifth of the genes um, with, with the sequence statement by equals 5, retaining the overall structure of the clustering, but but uh, making it um, making it more sparsely populated. So what does this tell us? So for example, there are genes that are um, low at T4 and T6 and high at T0 and T2. And these would include genes like FNIP1, MED13L, NRIP1. <coughs> Here, T4, T6. Actually, these are not low but high. Um, I thought it went the other way around. So these are uh, yellow here and red over there. And there are other genes for which the inverse is true, the ones that are down here. Um, these are highly expressed at T0 and then are repressed at that other time. So we can do a similar thing that we did for our um, defining genes from, from PCA analysis and define uh, the indivi individual data sets, which we just read out of the plot, and then use a parallel coordinates plot um, and plot the expression profiles. So this is the one set, this is the other set. So over the cell cycle, we have genes that get induced um, and genes that get repressed over the cell cycle. So these are the kind of, of clusters that we, that we find here. Now let's try to, to cluster them. 
So for a hierarchical clustering, we first need to produce a distance table. Remember, it works on distances, so we, we don't compute all the distances um, individually for every question. We just make a table of distances and then use that to make the, the distribution. So the f first and simplest thing is to use um, <clears throat> to calculate the distance matrix um, and then to cluster it. The hierarchical clustering H clust in R um, is very quick and the default plot procedure gives us this result. So this is a hierarchical clustering of all of these differentially expressed, uh, the top 250 differentially expressed genes from a cell cycle experiment. Now, didn't we say before that, that a clustering is a partitioning? So how do we use this for partitioning? It seems to me we can kind of pick out different groups at very different levels from, uh, from this description, from this clustering of the data. Right, so what, what does that mean? Um, <clears throat> well, that, that means we need a little bit more work to define what we actually mean with a cluster under, under this. Do we want clusters that are very fine-grained, or do we want clusters that are very coarse-grained, or whatever? So let's try making different clusters. But first, let's have another look at um, the, the distance matrix the distance matrix methods. This is, this is the one that we've already seen, the Euclidean distance metric. Um, it has a kind of a block structure that we can use here. Uh, this is the Canberra metric, which is much more all over the place, less well ordered. Um, this is the maximum metric, Minkowski metrics. So all of these are, are available here, and um, we need to basically look at the different heat maps and define which one has the best contrast and, and highest block structure. This is one minus correlation. Now, one minus correlation is not one of the inbuilt methods that exist, but we can very easily define our own procedures. Our, our own code and algorithm to define distances. So one minus correlation um, is simply calculated by taking the correlation, the absolute, one minus that, and looking at, at the distance. And it gives a block structure that, that looks like this. And um, I'm going to skip Minerva here. So perhaps, um, you know, we could use um, the, the maximum distance here. As having one of the more intriguing block structures and use that for clustering. So now our HC, or hierarchical cluster, is based on that maximum distance. <clears throat> I'll get, let's go back to our original dendro dendrogram. Now, the idea about actually generating clusters here is to take that dendrogram and cut it at a particular level. So for example, if we cut the dendrogram here at this level, it will naturally fall apart into two groups. And we could then say this is a group of two clusters in this way. That's how two clusters can be defined from this dendrogram. If we say we would rather have five groups instead, the algorithm can pick a different level to cut. That would be like this here. If we want 10 groups instead, or 20, or 50 groups instead, we can all do that with that 
dendrograms. So what's the correct solution here? And as I said before, that really depends on the kind of question that you're asking. There's no hard and fast rule which of these um, are the best. Obviously, there's a continuum. At one extreme of the continuum, everything falls into a single cluster. That is the least informative. At the other extreme of the continuum, every, every cluster contains one and only one element. And that's also minimally informative. So something between the every element in its own clusters or all elements in the same cluster is the best. And it really depends on the kind of analysis that we want to do, where we choose to, to cut this here. But let's <coughs> retrieve the actual indices and then use them to generate some parallel coordinate pl plots and check how different these expression profiles are in the first place. So in order to, to uh, get these um, parallel coordinates, we use the cut tree function on our hierarchical cluster, uh, define that we'd like a k of 20, and assign that to a variable which, which I now call class. So class now contains each of the 250 genes. And for each of these 250 genes, we find one number. And that number defines the cluster membership. So SGO2 is in cluster number 2. LRIF1 is also in cluster number 2. KIFC1 is in cluster number 2. Um, and so on. So how many? How many um, genes in each cluster? Well, there's an easy way to check this, and that's uh, using table, or perhaps even sort table, where the, the clusters are sorted by membership. Cluster number four has 48 members. Cluster number um, two has 23 members. Um, cluster number one only has a single member, as does 19, as does 20, and so on. But with these, the clusters are now defined. So we can use these cluster memberships to identify the names of the genes, and we can use the names of the genes to pull out um, the actual expression values, and then we can put that into one of these parallel coordinate plots. That's the code. So matrix plot of Datum, datum where class equals 10, um, and we'll plot 10 to 11 and 4. So 11 to 10 and 4. <coughs> right? So one set that appears kind of all over the place, simply generally ex uh, increasing in expression value. One of these clusters um, increases during the cell cycle. One of the clusters decreases during the cell cycle. And one of the clusters looks very similar to the one that has actually increased during the cell cycle. So mathematically, um, according to the metric that we're using, they seem to be different enough to fall into different um, hierarchical clusters. Visually inspecting them, we see no really um, convincing reason why they would not be falling together. Perhaps on average, this one is a little lower in its absolute values than that one. Now, I'd like you to, to do the same thing. Basically, um, copy some of that code, whatever code you need, into the myscript.r file for this session, and then edit it in a way where you produce uh, a, a hierarchical clustering all the way to a plot that looks like the plot we, we, we just saw, but using a different distance method. So we've used the
we've used D max here. Um, I would like you to either use Euclidean or Minkowski or Canberra or one minus correlation or something else. One of the other ones, not D max again. So copy the code into my script and edit it so that you run the same thing with a different clustering metric. And then we can compare whether the different clustering metric made the results different in any, in any important way.
Okay, now maybe I'll just step through one of the alternatives uh, down here. I, I see that, that it, this has worked for most of you, which is awesome. Um, let's just do the same thing with the one minus correlation. So these would be um, nine values from the one minus correlation and I would identify some clusters here that are larger and perhaps more interesting than the ones that, that we've seen with the Euclidean distance. But all over all the, the differences are not um, not very con compelling. So aesthetically, it, it kind of looks nice, but the clusters are not very homogeneous as we might expect them from biological interpretation. Um, one of the problems is that we require everything to be cut at the same level. And it might, might make more sense kind of um, looking at the information that's contained in the clusters that you get with information theoretic methods to dynamically adapt the cut level. There's a package here which is called dynamic tree cut, which does that, and for which I have example code in there. And um, another thing that, that becomes apparent is that the clusters seem to pu pull things apart that have similar <coughs> levels, um, a similar shape but different levels. And that's because we didn't actually normalize our data. It's raw as it is. So we could, we could normalize our data um, and then try clustering, which is simply completely based on shape. For example, with the dynamic tree cut, So if we simply cluster based on shape, then um, we get clusters that are, that are kind of more convincing in, in, in one respect. But in another respect, I wouldn't really know why this ends up differently than that. So, so once again, we have a similar problem. Mathematically, we can, we can cluster this very clearly, but it's not entirely sure um, how to interpret this biologically. One method that's quite interesting and robust ac across many applications is affinity propagation clustering. Uh, that was published in Science 10 years ago by Brendan Fry of um, University of Toronto. 
And if we run this affinity propagation clustering and uh, calculate a heat map from that, um, this actually seems to give us the, the clearest and most defined and most distinct block structure overall. Now, if we can exploit that for clustering, uh, we should be doing pretty well. So that's a, the kind, the amount of information that's, that's there. Uh, two large subclusters that are, seem to be important, um, maybe with a little bit of internal structure, but overall, except for these two large subclusters, everything else is, is pretty much noise. So if we look at the plots regarding these, um, now I think I have a, a better separation into things that actually look dissimilar and don't just seem to be dissimilar according to some mathematical method. So I would say um, from the things that we've seen here and the things that we've tried here, um, Affinity propagation clustering seems to give the best results, at least visually, in, in, this, um, in this scenario. So which one should we use? Um, this brings us to the question of cluster quality metrics. How can we actually measure how well-defined and how informative these clusters are? And there's a, there's a, a library there, a cluster valid, um, <clears throat> which requires a, f a few sub-libraries. And that, that library basically runs clustering on data points according to a large number of different clustering methods. So hierarchical k-means, uh, Diana, Fanny, self-organizing maps, um, k-medoids with PAM, SOTA, CLARA model, and so on. And then it is then it's possible, after running all of these validations, to determine which one was actually the best. So instead of running them one by one, this goes, this is done all in a package, and all of the results are, um, are then, then made available. Let's see how that worked. It didn't run. Less. Okay, something's something's not working here. I don't want to go deeply into this to troubleshoot it. Um, we'd need to adapt it for, for um, individual problems anyway. Anyway, there's this map package cluster valid and that in principle allows you um, to compare all of these different clustering methods and then apply um, mathematically founded um, measurements that are able to distinguish the quality of the clusters from each other, at least in terms of internal validation. Now we've, we've encountered TSNE, is, is, is that an alternative? So um, let's, have a, let's have a brief look at TSNE clustering. We see some intriguing similarities and, 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 and substructures here. Um, question is, are they meaningful? Now, I've, I've run this 
many times. I, I mentioned before that if it's not the results of this TS and E are dependent on what the starting values are. And for some starting values, it will just simply come up with a much better embedding. So if we use this seed and work on this data, we can get um, a, a relatively good and, and consistent clustering uh, from TS and E. Well, it's, it's not a clustering. It's an embedding. And we, we, can, we can work with that. Um, in a little more detail. So this runs for a little while. Slightly changing the embedding, stochastically searching for better solutions. If you want to work with the same data set, I've I've uh, saved the results into the file tsneref.dat and lines um, 699 to 701. If you just execute that code, then you will also have the same result without uh, needing to actually run the iteration over. Jesus, how many how many uh, iterations am I asking for? Oh, 8,000. That seems excessive. halfway done. Normally we like these procedures that take um, about as long as it takes to boil a fresh pot of coffee. <laughs> We're not quite ready for a coffee break yet, so. Um, Boris, I'm sorry uh -huh. to, this is, I have forgotten what, what, what it was that's why I'm asking. Can you please remind us what seed actually means? What the seed means? Um, it's the value, to a certain value. The seed value is the value from which we start the random number generator. So once we set the seed value for a random number generator, the random numbers that are generated are always the same for a particular seed. So when you pick your uh, seed value, mm -hmm. what's the... Um, so the idea is when I pick a particular seed value here, and the stochastic embedding process will run in exactly the same way um, every single time. And it will run in the same way for me, and it will run in the same way for you. So if you do, do the same thing with the same code, you should, you should get the exact same arrangement of points on, on your specific <laughs> choice to remember what we see is arbitrary. It's arbitrary. It can be any reasonable of the number. Um, if, the, if the C is not um, defined, the system takes a random seed which it generates from um, parameters of your system. So uh, <coughs> normally in order to, to make random numbers, um, systems collect what's called entropy, which is related to time and processor states and whether and how you move the mouse and what the intervals between the key clicks were. So things that are not predictable that will then make this behave in the best possible way is something that looks like a random number, even though it isn't. And that we're able to set the seed and then come up with identical runs illustrates that this is a deterministic process and not a random process. Okay, so this is this is done. I've I've saved the data and um, I can define a color spectrum. I, in, in the script, I go on a little bit about why such a color spectrum is good. It's basically a, rain um, a rainbow type uh, spectrum. I mentioned that there's a number of inbuilt color uh, spectra that we can use to apply for categorical uh, coloring. So for example, the rainbow spectrum um, that's inbuilt looks like this. The heat colors look like this. We've, we've used them in the heat map. That's the default there. They go from red all the way to white. Um, there are terrain colors. Um, 
that kind of emulate from low to high the shading that could be um, um, coloring a map of terrain with lush green valleys at the bottom and barren hills and snow-capped peaks as we go higher and higher. Topography colors are similar, um, only there's um, the deep blue ocean at, at one end and uh, CM colors, cyan, magenta, just go from cyan to magenta. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot more on colors in the, in, in the uh, plotting reference script that, that is in one of the, in one of the units. Um, now, this is code that here that loosely generates uh, color values um, based on the Munsell color wheel. And that's an interesting way to look at color. Um, here, the colors are not separated by, by some notion of um, red, green, and blue values, but they're separated by um, perceptual. So these colors are meant to be perceptually equidistant, at least if you're not, uh, if, if you don't have any red, green bl blindness, then you will find that it's easier to actually distinguish colors that come from one of these Munsell color wheels. So for example, if we, if we look into this range here of 14 and 15 from the rainbow spectrum um, and compare that with the range of 14 and 15, I would say, at least to my eyes, these are virtually indistinguishable and these blues are slightly more distinguishable. So the idea here is th that you map that into a color space where uh, adjacent colors become more different. For that's, that's what it's useful for. So we can, we can use that and plot um, the result of our TS and E embedding. And we actually find that the clusters that we found with affinity propagation kind of fall into similar classes also under, under TSE embedding. Other classes are more mixed and, 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 and some classes are, are, are more different. Um, so now we can, we can do a similar thing that we did with um, the, the Cho cell cycle data and um, Uh, start plotting the numbers and, and, and squinting at them and, and identifying which numbers we would, we would like to compare. By the default, this is all very large. We, we can plot it much smaller and then actually there's less overlap there and we can color them and use, use that information to pick that out and find some sets and do a parallel coordinates plot and in the same way. So these are these, these normalized matrices here of, of three of these clusters. And it, it kind of shows to a, to a degree how, how these clusters fall into separate spots and in, into separate um, categories. But um, typing all these numbers by hand and and, and figuring that out um, is really tedious and really error prone. So wouldn't it be nice if we could work with these plots interactively? And the answer is yes, it would be very nice. And we actually can. R supports work, interactive work with plots like that. So there's two functions for interactive work with 2D plots. One is identify and one is locator. And <coughs> So in order to use identify, we, we simply run identify. And what happens then is that our cursor changes to a crosshair. And we can then click on individual points and it will remember what points of the original data set we used. So you can keep on doing that until you press escape 
And then the points are labeled, and the row numbers of the points are identified. So that's really nice, because we can start doing things. For example, we could write a function that actually shows us what we picked, and then uh, displays the actual profiles in a, in a matrix plot, and finally returns the numbers so that we can use them, for example, to retrieve the, the, the gene window. So the first thing we would like to do, do if we want to get the data and display it um, is we, are, we would now want to work with two windows. So we assign the name of the first window, open a second window, store its ID, and return focus to the first window. And then we define a function to pick genes. Um, in principle, um, <coughs> once I've once I'm entering the function, I, I set the focus to the second window, and I plot an empty plot. So the empty plot will then accommodate the, the parallel coordinates of the actual expression values and, and labels. And then we go into the main picking loop, um, where we forever um, pick in a while loop and um, assign the values that we get. and. Um, discover if we've pressed the escape key and break from the loop if we did. And while we're picking loops, we're just um, fetching the, the data and plotting it in the parallel coordinates plot and displaying it. So that's, that's actually pretty neat. So let's have a look here. Um, we start by reproducing our plot and starting to pick. Here. I want more space here. So let's look at this one. And here is its expression profile and that one and that one and they're very similar and that one. And this one is from a different cluster but it looks very close. So what does it do? It's here. Okay, I see that you know I can see a reason why it's in a different cluster. So this is this. And what about these blue ones? Are they really different? Because they end up really different and far away. Uh, yeah. Something very different is going on here. OK, so in this way, we can then start working with our um, two-dimensional plotted data and actually discover and identify what these genes are. We can open second windows, we can open third windows, and, 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 and get more information about that and uh, play in interesting ways. And once we click Escape, um, we get the actual um, row numbers. So then we can, we can go back and fetch gene names or you know, whatever. If you want an unpick option, you would need to code it. But the simple thing to do would be to simply remove it from the list of picks and, um, yeah, and replot the, the parallel coordinate plot. So there's not an unpick function built in there, but the way that this, this code is written, it would be easy to add unpick, unpick functionality. So in a, in a similar um, vein, we still have to pick individual things. Wouldn't it be nice if we were able to kind of just draw boundaries around them, especially if there are many genes and, and they're partially overlapped, um, which would be good because um, that means they're very similar in the plot, um, and to select them all. So for that, we can use the locator function. 
So locator gives us um, the x and y coordinates of the picks that we have. So if we click into the plot a couple of times and then hit escape, we get a list of values, $x and $y. And we can use that to draw a polygon into the plot. And once the polygon is closed, we can determine what's inside and what's outside of the polygon. <clears throat> so that's kind of straightforward. We can, we can use this, um, this function to draw lines. Um, now, if we capture the coordinates and we end, it's really easy to then close the polygon, basically say once we are done, we would like to set the line coordinate of the last plot to last point to the first point. And then we have a shape. And that Shape now can be used to determine what's inside and what's outside. Um, <clears throat> so then we all need to only go through the data points that we have here and determine for each one whether it's inside or outside the polygon. Now, if you think that's easy to code, you're wrong. Uh, Inside-outside questions for polygons can be fiendishly difficult. Um, Fortunately, there is a convenient function in the Generalized Additive Modeling Package, MGCB, that we can use. And the function is called in, out. And that then makes the code very simple. In fact, it, I'm not going to go through the details, but it kind of looks like um, the code that we wrote previously for the picking function. So let's close the graphics windows. Um, make a new device, a small empty frame for our matrix plots, um, set focus, replot our windows, set focus on the second one, make an empty frame for our parallel coordinates, set the focus into this window and use that function for our picks. Now, um, what shall we pick? Let's pick the points here. So now we've captured all these points in this polygon and put them on this, on this coordinate. And let's contrast them with <clears throat> things that we get from over here. There we go. So this is a kind of more advanced version of our individual point clicking. We can work interactively with plots like that, um, extract and store information, and um, further analyze it. Okay, so in terms of um, clustering, I think that's all I wanted to go over. There's additional code there um, for 3D embedding. It's the same thing with TS and E. Instead of two dimensions, we go into three dimensions. Uh, that uses um, the RGL package, um, which is based on the Mac on, on um, X 
graphics and I think, oh, I'm not even sure what the underlying graphics package is on Windows. Um, it doesn't always work as expected, so I'm, I'm not even going to fire it up here. Uh, it depends a little bit on your current state of the operating system and what, what graphics libraries you have installed on your computers. But um, in terms of 2D plotting and, and clustering, I think we'll wrap up here. So what have we done previously? Previously, we've just asked about um, how to identify similar genes uh, by looking at regression, by looking at correlations, and by working with dimension reduction techniques like principal components analysis. In clustering, we're, we're generalizing this and using this to pull out uh, partitions from the data according to its internal structure. And we have to be careful because, of course, there's many ways to partition the data and not all of these ways are biologically relevant and uh, it would be good if we can then find some criterion to um, identify which ones are the most relevant. In principle, similar techniques apply that, that we've used with dimension reduction. We can use basic clustering techniques, we can use uh, t-stochastic neighbor embedding, and we can then use methods like I've demonstrated with this uh, point picking or the locator package to actually pull out the data sets and in this way do some, um, some manual uh, um, further classification and further analysis. Thank you.